your Bibles up to Psalm 30. Psalm 30. If you had something you wanted to praise the Lord about, please do so after the service. Go to somebody and tell them an area that God's blessed you. And you don't know what encouragement is to praise the Lord. It uh, not only encourages you, but encourages those around you. And I think it's good for Christians to be in the habit of doing so. And practicing gratitude. We've got so much to be thankful for. God is so good to us. I really live a privileged life, and I recognize that. I know it. I've got, uh, I just got life really good. And um, I'll be something we're grateful for. I'm not sorry about that. I sure don't want to have life bad. And so it's really wonderful to be saved and be on our way to heaven. And we have all these things to go along with it. It's wonderful to have something to praise the Lord about. Tony, can you turn up the volume on this just a, a little bit? And uh, just... On the, on the pulpit mic. There we go. We're in Psalm chapter 30, and we're going to begin reading in verse 6. We're going to read down to verse 12, and I want you to pay special attention. There's a lot here that we don't have time to preach this evening, but it's very straightforward, as the Word of God always is, and so it'll be a real help. You let the Holy Spirit preach to you even as we read the text. Verse 6 of Psalm 30. And in my prosperity I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by thy favor thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. I cried to thee, O Lord, and unto the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me, Lord. Be thou my helper. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. To the end that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. Heavenly Father, help us to find value in praising the Lord Jesus and worth in it. And Lord, I ask that just for the sake of the glory that we bring to you, that our lives would be worth living. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, Psalm uh, 30 is, and my Bible has just a little heading on it that said this is a prayer of dedication at the uh, building of David's house or at the dedication of the house of David. So this is almost like a house warming for David. And this is a psalm that the Holy Spirit gave him and this gave him really to be a blessing to us. And there are a lot of elements to it, a whole lot of aspects to it. I really want to focus this evening on verses 6 through 12. And I think it would be appropriate to read our way down there just to get a little bit of an idea of the direction. It's, he begins by, by just singing the Lord's praise. He says, I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up and has not made my foes to rejoice over me. Now that is the understatement of the century, along with all the other ones, I think. Uh, there's a lot of understatements. But for David to say, you haven't allowed my foes or my enemies to rejoice over me, think about what an underdog David was. He had a major disadvantage in that he would not play by the devil's rules. Uh, if David played by the devil's rules, there were a lot of things he could do and uh, to defend himself. I personally believe that David was the kind of man that you wouldn't want to cross, and the Lord just gave him extra special skill and physical strength. And I don't think that, I don't think that all the men in this church here today could take on David and live to tell the story. He was a rough, tough man. But he had spe something special. He was a mighty man. It's interesting that the thing that David did to Uriah, Saul tried to do with David. Remember what David did to Uriah? He put him in a place of battle, and then they withdrew, and an arrow came down from the wall, and Uriah was killed. Remember, Saul did that to David. He said, he gave him, he said, if you will kill a hundred Philistines, then I'll give my daughter's hand in marriage. That was a death sentence for David. Sent him out to do something, and uh, David, uh, honestly, I, I suppose he was interested in, in Michelle or Michael, or however you want to pronounce the name of Saul's daughter, Michal, if you want to pronounce it in the Hebrew, it's a lovely name for a lady. Uh, if anyone here has a daughter, I would recommend naming her that if you'd like to. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, I suppose that more than that, David had a desire to honor his king and really didn't count his life too dear to go and to do something to serve King Saul. But he was the Lord's anointed and Saul was trying to kill him and he went out and God gave him the victory. David, didn't, David had a disadvantage over Saul because Saul was not playing by the rules. Saul was not concerned about whether or not God was pleased with his life or whether or not he was going to thwart the will of God or do something that 
God would judge him for, and yet David was. And you're always at a disadvantage, it seems as though, when you try to do right. It doesn't seem like a disadvantage to do right sometimes. I mean, it puts you, puts you in a place where everyone around you has an advantage because they're not playing by the rules. And if you ever play a game and you're playing by the rules and someone else isn't, it's frustrating. And so when David praises the Lord for this, he said, I'll extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up and hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. In spite of those circumstances, God delivered David to the place that now he's dedicating the king's house. And it's his house. And boy, what a marvelous time this is. He said, O Lord, my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. And so all these hurts and all these wounds and all these hard times, David looks back in the past and he says, all those things I went through that seemed as though they were insurmountable obstacles that I would never survive, it's almost as though they didn't happen because I, my wounds have been healed. Thou hast healed me. And so these things, these hardships are in the past for him now. And then he says, Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Sing unto the Lord, all ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. And then he mentions something that I hope that you are acquainted with. For his anger endureth but for a, but a moment. In his favor is life. He said, God, even in your wrath, you've been very merciful toward me. And I have to say that God, in his judgment in my life even, has been very, very merciful. None of us have come anywhere nearly receiving what we deserve and because God is so merciful. And isn't he gentle with us? And, you know, uh, God is long-suffering, and it's one of the most beautiful qualities that reflects the holy nature of our God is this matter of long-suffering. No other just, no, no justice in any kind of man's comprehension is coupled with long-suffering. Justice and long-suffering almost seem as though they're opposites, and yet our Father, though he is just, is long-suffering. He's always waiting for us to repent, always waiting for us, always ready for us, always unwilling to give us final judgment. The day is going to come that God finally judges the world and does so in a very, very final way. But he doesn't want to, and, he, and David is well aware of that characteristic of God is mercy. And boy, I'll tell you something, we get frustrated much more quickly than God does, and we're ready to come down and final judgment to write people off and be finished and be done. And yet that's not the way God is. And so David knew that about him. And so he says, but joy, he said, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. There's a very beautiful song about that. And I think it's so lovely. There's another, there's a couple songs that are written from this psalm. It's a beautiful psalm. Now we're going to get into, into our text this evening. And we move into transition here in verse 6. And in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. You ever been in a place when it seemed as though things are permanently good? <laughs> Aren't you glad that isn't the way life is? I'm serious about that. I, a perfect life it does, it would, would not be perfect. It really wouldn't. Without the things that show us that we need God, without the things in our life that draw us near Him and show us that we cannot depend upon our position or upon the, the things that, that uh, have happened in our past, we would have no future to speak of. It would be, to me, very, very difficult to live a life in which there were, was no hardship, in which there was no struggle, because we would never overcome anything. It would be very, very frustrating. You know, the proof of that is that you, you sometimes, and we probably don't personally know that many of those people, but sometimes you meet someone that is born with what they call a silver spoon in their mouth. In other words, they inherit so much wealth that they couldn't possibly spend in their life. And there are literally some people so wealthy that they have to hire servants to spend their money. And, it, I mean, it's a really a full-time job, and they have to get multiple, many of them. And I'm serious, it's, it's beyond our comprehension in a lot of ways. And you know that most of their children are so frustrated and so unhappy, and many, much of the time uh, they end up hating their parents and being resentful about the life that they were born into because they've just had everything. They've never had a conflict and never had a struggle. You know, um, Larry Burkett, financial counselor, uh, and I'm not endorsing Larry Burkett this evening, but one of the things that he used to teach with his financial uh, seminar and finances from the book of Proverbs, he used to always teach parents that you shouldn't leave your children too much of inheritance. He believed that there was a principle of inheritance in the scripture, but it's more to do with the land in the nation of Israel. But he said, never leave your children uh, more than a house and maybe $100,000. If you do more than that, you'll just wreck their lives. You'll, 
You'll make it so that they, they just they feel as though their life never has any value in it because they never have to earn away for themselves. They never have any, any hardship. They never have to do anything that proves that they can be anything. They're always living off of their parents, and it's really frustrating to a child. There's a lot of truth in that, and I think a lot of that's what David is speaking of here. He said, in my prosperity, I felt as though nothing would ever go wrong. In a lot of ways, he's grateful that things just didn't remain perfect forever. And we ought to, we ought to be thankful for the, to the Lord for things that teach us patience. We ought to be thankful for the Lord for a little bit of suffering, for some hardship, for some things that we wouldn't want to go through again, but that we're glad we went through and wouldn't trade for anything in the world. And so that's the, that's the tenor uh, or the tone of, of what we're looking at here. Verse 7. It begins to describe God's character. Lord, by thy favor thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. And David speaks of a time in which he was out of fellowship with the Lord. And it's when it seemed as though when he prayed, God did not hear him. And here is a prayer, here is a plea to holy God that I think is something that is a pattern that we could learn to pray in order to get a hold of God. And I just think that this is so unique, verses 8 through 12. It literally is this. I'll just summarize it as kind of what, what I, I said at the beginning. And that is that David makes a bargaining plea, or he makes a case, if you will. His case to the Lord is that, God, I'm worth something if I glorify you. God, my life has value if it brings glory to you, so God, spare my life so I can glorify you. So his case to God is, God, deliver me, restore me, give me a relationship with, with uh, you, because there is value in an individual that praises your name. Now, isn't that interesting? How many times have you found your value and your ability to bring glory to God? How many times have you seen the value in your life? Not as being, oh, I'm uh, special or I, uh, I believe in myself or I have a right to uh, be happy or to be successful, but literally, my life has value in that I can point to the Lord Jesus Christ and bring him glory. And uh, your plea to God would be, God, I'm a worm. I'm lowly. I'm worthless. I couldn't begin to bring you something, God, that would impress you. How can you impress God? How can any one of us here say to God, God, I've got a wonderful voice. I'm Chris Callahan. And, uh, you know, uh, God, look at, you know, spare me because of my talent. Well, that's ridiculous. God created your talent. God, I'm so intelligent. I have, um, I've got a brain, and I'm able to win friends and make friends and influence people. And so I could build your church that way. You need me because I'm talented. Uh, God, um, I'm just a good guy. I don't make any trouble. I don't make waves. I don't bother anybody. And so you need me around. No, friend, none of us really has anything that will impress God because everything we have is given to us by God. I've said many times, it's very true, the very breath that we breathe, the very fact that we are breathing and having breath <laughs> is a gift from God. Our life is a gift from God. I'll tell you something, something you ought to be grateful to God for. You ought to understand that you are obligated to glorify God because you're breathing. And that's a gift. It's a wonderful thing to be able to breathe. And so many times we're so ungrateful for our lives, and it's because uh, we don't understand that they are given to us, but that they belong to Him, but we've got an obligation to do something. And Christian, if you want God's favor and God's blessing and fellowship with, with Holy God, perhaps you ought to understand that there's one thing in this life that could give you value before God, and that is that you could give Him glory. The one area in your life that makes you have value, makes it as though, uh, makes it so that there is something that you are able to give God, and that is glory. Now, I want to tell you something. You're not giving him something that comes from you or something that, that uh, belongs some other place. You're not bringing him something that he does not deserve, but you're literally giving him that which belongs to him, that pleases him, and that is glory. And so David said, I cried unto the Lord, and the Lord I made supplication. Supplication is pleadings and requests, and uh, carries this idea of, of earnestness, earnest prayer. And he said, what profit is there? Here's David's argument. God, 
What good is it in my blood? In other words, what good am I dead? <laughs> I mean, you know, um, evidently they didn't have organ donors in those days. Uh, <laughs> so maybe there would have been a little profit in it. Uh, I don't know. Uh, that's not funny, is it? What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Now, that's a rhetorical question. Lee, what's the answer to that question? If David and no one else would praise God, would the dust do it? Yes. Yes, <laughs> yes it would. And so God's going to get the glory. But Christian, I want you to learn something about God, and that is that He prefers glory from us. Mm -hmm. uh, if we would not praise God, the very rocks would cry out. Mm -hmm. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth forth His handiwork. Uh, day unto day utter his speech, and night unto night uh, showeth forth knowledge. There's no voice or no speech, uh, what is it, nor language in which his uh, praise is, what? In which his voice is not heard. And even rockish or in dustish or whatever the languages are that the inanimate objects speak, they'll glorify God. Last week I did some traveling you know, across America. And as I did so, I looked at pieces of uh, terrain that bring glory to God and show there's a God. Show what kind of a vast, measureless God he is and how, how immeasurable he is. And so he gets his glory. But David said, God, I'm better dead than alive. Brother Charlie's favorite verse is Ecclesiastes. Is it six, Charlie? One of your favorite verses, the one about a, a, a dead or a live dog is better than a dead lion? 9-4. Nine, Ecclesiastes 9-4. A live dog is better than a dead lion. And that's the bargain David is making. Now, you say, Pastor, I don't really have much to bargain with God for. I really am not very much. Well, how about saying to God, God, I could glorify you more dead than alive. In other words, I'm worth more alive than dead. I, I, I said that back, right? I could glorify you more alive than dead. I'm worth more alive than dead because I'll glorify you. In essence, David said, God, no matter what in my life, I'll bring you praise and so give me fellowship. How many times have you prayed that? Most of the time we come to the place where David's at, we whine. God, I don't have anything. And David says, God, just give me fellowship and I'll give you glory. And that's better than killing me. If you were dead, you'd have something less than you have. You'd have less opportunity to glorify God. And I don't know how many of us thinks that our life is all about glorifying God, but friend, that's the fact. That's what you're created for. If you think you're created for something different, if you think you're created to find your place in this world or to accomplish something or to make your mark or whatever, you're confused. You're created to bring God glory, and when you get that wrong in your mind, everything else gets messed up too. So first of all, you and I must understand our purpose. We were created to give Him glory. And secondly, that's the, that's the area that we have to make a request to God. When we have no, nothing else to bargain with God, we can say, God, I'll give you glory. And you know something? Doing what you're made for is the only thing that will satisfy you. Being what you're supposed to be is the only thing in this life that will satisfy you. So many people spend all their lives trying to be something. If they could just be what they're supposed to be, they'd be satisfied, but they never do it. They spend all their life trying to be... You ever heard someone say, I'm trying to be somebody? They're not trying to be themselves. They're trying to be something that brings them glory. They'll never satisfy them. They'll never be somebody. They'll never be something else. You're created to bring God glory, and the, as soon as you realize that... It'll bring you to a place of humility first, but secondly, it'll be, bring you to a place of peace. And you'll stop trying to be something God doesn't want you to be, and instead you'll become what He does want you to be. And you'll be satisfied, and it'll bring Him glory. And so He says, Hear, O Lord, and have... He says, Shall the dust praise thee? Shall I declare thy truth? The answer, according to Brother Lee, is yes. If you disagree, you've got to take it up with Brother Lee. He said so. Verse 10, Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be thou my helper. Lord, be thou my helper. Help me, God. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. What is it in David's life that made it so that he could say, by the way, this isn't some kind of sensual dancing like what we have today. This means leaping for joy or just literally being exuberant, just thrilled to death to where he just can't hold still. He says, you've turned for me my mourning into dancing. What changed David's mourning into dancing. 
his decision to glorify God. I mean, here's a prayer that goes from the bottom, from saying, Thou didst hide my face, and I was troubled. I cried to thee, Lord, and the Lord I made my supplication. And then he said, Sidney, you're confused. Take the glasses off and quit imitating me. All right. <laughs> he looks like Ray Charles back there doing the glasses and the dance. <laughs> what profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? And David realizes exactly what it is that he's created for. He's created to bring glory to God. He comes to the place where he's what he's supposed to be. He makes God the promise, God, I will glorify you, and everything is suddenly okay. All of a sudden, he's not bothered anymore. He's more, gone from mourning to dancing. There's nothing incredible that has happened between verses 10 and verse 11. The only thing that has happened is that David's got his mind right. If you're ungrateful tonight, your mind's messed up, and it'll lead you into depression. It'll lead you into darkness. It will lead you into a pit. But if you make up your mind that it would be better for you to glorify God than for the dust to do it. That there would be more profitable in you alive glorifying God than for your blood to be shed. It will change your circumstances instantly. Instantly, the very same circumstances will be mourning to joy, mourning to exuberance, to, to just being unable to contain yourself. That's kind of a nice way to live. Now, you drive people nuts. How you doing today? I just can't handle it. It's so good. <laughs> you know? Uh, I see. You ever feel like that? I feel like that sometimes. I feel like sometimes you just blow people away. You just, you got it so good. That's the way life is when you're right. To the end that my glory may sing praise to the end, not be silent. To the end is another way of saying for the purpose that or so that this may be accomplished. And what will be accomplished is that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. So people will hear about you, God. They'll know about you and your goodness in my life because I'm going to tell them. O oh Lord my God, I'll give thanks unto thee forever. And I think that if you get a hold of that this week, it'll really just make all the difference in the world and it'll help you to bring glory to God. He'll be pleased and maybe he'll give you some life. You'll be back here next Sunday or Wednesday night. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the value that you find in our ability to be what we're supposed to be and to praise you. Thank you for the life that you give us. We're grateful to you for it. Thankful. Lord, it's wonderful and you deserve the glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Alright. Five years old. Man, Devin's having a birthday Monday.